Does that work better? Great, fantastic. Okay, everybody, this will be fun and exciting. Everybody should like buckle in because this is gonna be at lightning fast uh, since it is lightning talks. Um, some of these folks have a lot to get across in a short period of time. Um, so we'll try to do this as quick as we can and we'll learn a whole bot a lot about how to you know, fire hose information to you. Uh, so, um, everybody will have a chance to show who they are. They've got a title slide. Um, we'll want to be pretty quick with this so there really isn't a chance to have questions. Um, if you have questions, you should grab people at the break. Um, there are seven lightning talks. I really appreciate the folks that on, because of me, short notice, uh, had to put all of this together. So. Uh, if it's bumpy, it's my fault, not theirs. Um, our first lucky contestant is Jim Mellinder, and thank you, everybody. Let's see how this goes. Yeah, let's see how it goes indeed. Uh, my name is Jim Melander. I've been working with Bro for about, oops, Zeke. Zeke Wilder, right, Vern? That was in the password file. We actually had a Zeke account. Uh, since about 2000, I'm actually retired from LBL, but Zeke keeps pulling me back in. So anyway, I, I've been working with some stats, and it's a very, very interesting uh, part of Bro, and I'm going to talk about a plugin that I wrote for some stats. Let's see here. Well, what some stats does, it you know, collects summary statistics on all the worker nodes and then aggregates that and delivers the, the result. Now the existing probabilistic SumSats plugin only, only do cardinality, so you're only going to get increments by one, right? So, um, so you can count like how many times such and such IP hit your, uh, your network and things like that. But what if you want more than that? I actually wanted to do a heavy hitter script, so I wanted to, to do byte counts by IP in a memory efficient manner. Now the, uh, as I wrote here, you can use the sum plugin, which is gonna keep byte counts for everything. You can't purge, memory just explodes. Some stats is not really memory efficient anyway. It needs some work on that front. But I decided there had to be another way. And so I was um, searching the literature. And uh, this is based on a seminal paper in 1982 by Misra and Greece. So I put kind of an MG logo there because, well, I used to have an MG. Uh, but it's, it's an algorithm that was, uh, there was a paper written in, in 2017. The basic idea is real simple. A fixed size table and smart purging of data that is stale or doesn't make the heavy hitters list, and I'm gonna actually go into how it works. You know, this is pretty standard. You know, you put in an IP and an amount. That could be a byte count. You just fill the table, right? Then you update the amounts. But what happens when the table's full? There's no room to add it, right? You have a, a new entry, no room to add it. The algorithm is real simple, but it's actually fairly difficult to, to program, and I'll explain why. Uh, you actually compute a median of, the, of a sample of the entries. You reduce all the values by the median, delete all entries that are now less than or equal to zero, and then because of the definition of median, uh, and your median's right in the middle, so on the average, you're gonna be deleting half of the table. You're gonna be clearing half the table out. But since we're just doing a sample, it's not necessarily a guarantee. It's very, very difficult to, well, there are probabilistic ways to actually compute a median over a, a summary as well, which is probably another thing I'm gonna tackle at some point. So anyway, here we go. We computed a median of this whole table, and the average number of slots is free. It is 50%. So we have all these free slots. Now we can put our entry in, and we can keep track of the total medians that were subtracted for the final result. And that bottom point is very, very important. 
you know, just to program this in a, you know, first V1 of the, of the program is just you go through the table and release, which is like a, a first generation garbage collection, stop the world kind of implementation. That is not acceptable in a real time application like Bro. You have to come up with, with a way to do a lazy delete, which, I mean, you can do just by stepping through the table one by one. Oh, can I free this one? Can I free this one? Can I free this one? There's uh, some more advanced things involving uh, min heaps that, that I'm experimenting with to make it as efficient as possible. But in, in this uh, calculation here, we free approximately half of them every iteration once the table fills. And let's see, so we add it. We keep track of the grand total as well, which is easy, obviously. So, and then you have all these free slots. So the next couple entries you can add. Now, how much time do I have? One minute, okay. So, final results are the contents of the table with the total median added. Um, about 10% probably, the 10% on the top are, are reliable. There are some data patterns that don't work very well. Um, lots of small entries. Let's see, you can actually install the plugin directly into the SumStats plugin directory or you can actually do it in a site directory. I have a top case sort function using a min heap. Uh, I also have two demo programs, heavy hitters using the sum plugin and this one using the, the um, my program, and they both use a, a, a long connection because you, you have to like decide at the end of the, the sum sets epoch, you want to sample a connection that's, that's, you know, that's still in play. So I'm gonna put them online soon, and I'm out of time, but I'm done. So anyway, thank you. What did I have to do to uh, escape? Is mine not next? Oh, got it. Okay. Yep. All right. Thank you. All right. Yeah, great. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm Christian. Uh, I work at Corelight. I, uh, I'm a Zeek old timer. I worked on it when it was still called Bro. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and I'm going to be talking about something that came out of discussions that we had about what could you do to make it easier to run, uh, in this particular case, Bro and Suricata together. Uh, and, and there are clearly sort of very technically complicated solutions to this, and then we came upon a potentially much simpler solution that sort of is just helping you make log correlation that comes out of both systems, you know, easier. And so, if you're, you know, somewhat familiar with Zeek logs, then you know that this, you know, in their in their JSON representation, uh, gives you UIDs that make correlation across Zeek's log types really easy. So, for example, in this case where you have a con log on the left and a HTTP log on the right, you get this UID and correlation is is trivial. Um, so this is this is great. Um, this also exists for lots of other log types, so you can easily pivot and and and, and so forth. Um, Pretty much the exact same thing also exists in Suricata land. They also have a JSON log, and they also have logs for, or log entries for different event types, and in their case, they have a flow ID that does the exact same thing. The actual ID looks different, but you can correlate things together, and that is likewise really nice. Um, where it gets a little more tricky is if you have Zeek and Suricata logs, because in that situation, that, that concept sort of falls apart. So on the one hand, you have, you know, your flow tuple right there, and on the other hand, you have a sort of slightly differently expressed flow tuple, in this case, you know, TCP is uppercase, but so you have to sort of, you know, figure out like what are the exact values that you care about, and then how do you sort of pull them together and, and do that comparison, and that is no bueno. So it should really be easier to do that. And so I'm here to tell you that we have come up with a way to make this much nicer, and it's called the uh, community ID. Uh, this is sort of a term that sort of just came out of those discussions, and the goal is basically to standardize flow hashing so that different network monitoring tools can do this identically. 
And so we thought incredibly hard about this and came up with this like, super simple uh, first version of how you could do this. And so the dots here mean concatenation, and it's basically just a, a version number, since we anticipate that this stuff will need revising a bunch of times, uh, a colon, and then basically a base64 encoded hash of a seed and the flow tuple. And I'm glossing over some details here, but in principle, sort of as simple as you can possibly make this. And so what this looks like in practice is then you have these logs side by side, and when you enable this feature in Bro and, you know, respectively um, Suricata, then you get an entry that matches in both logs, and you can correlate them really easily. Uh, this is actually real. This runs in both Bro and Suricata at this point. In Suricata, it's forthcoming. Um, but this is fantastic because you can now really easily correlate logs that come out of both of these systems. And so, uh, just as a very quick sort of summary slide, um, this is intentionally super basic right now and certainly does not address all of the possible use cases that come to mind. The point of this is right now to give people something that they can run and allow us to give feedback or get feedback. So if you're interested in this kind of thing, try it out. Tell us if it doesn't do what you need, what you would like to see it provide, and then we can see how we can work that in there. Right now, there, there are two references that you might want to check out. There is a sort of spec not normative or anything like sort of just a like wordy expression of how this works. Um, and a reference implementation that is just a quick Python script so that should you decide to implement this somewhere, you actually know that you're producing the right results, like in a, in a Wireshark or a Snort or whatever you, know, you might want to add. Uh, and then for, for Zeek specifically, there is a package that you can just install and it will add those uh, new ID values to your, to your con log. I uh, already mentioned it's coming up in Suricata, so, so uh, Victor is working on that as we speak. Uh, there will be a longer version of this talk coming up at Suricon for those of you who are going there. Um, and I'm pretty excited about this because it basically means that there's for once something that like, two uh, network monitoring projects have been working on together, which I think is far too rare. And I have far too much time left, but I'm done. So thank you all. <laughs> So good afternoon, everyone, again. I'm going to talk about a pretty um, easy use case of Bro that we found out a couple of months ago. So as a university network, we, we get usually hit a lot by phishing. And one of the phishing attack was really cool because it, it took us like a couple of seconds or minutes after it got first reported to us to determine what exactly they were doing. Um, so one of our diligent uh, users actually reported a phish back to us saying that this is the email we got. Um, and when we, uh, when we uh, get the phishing emails as report, 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 reported to us, we do not disable them right away because we, we like to actually know what exactly they are doing so that we can track them down in our logs. So uh, one of the fish was a VPN fish where the fisher actually sent a, uh, sent, uh, sent a malicious site that they actually uh, pretended to be University of Delaware's phishing uh, uh, VPN account, and then they sent that, uh, that that's, uh, website URL in a phishing email. And people who clicked on that e uh, who clicked on that URL actually, uh, and if they submitted the credentials, no matter whether uh, right or wrong, they were redirected to our actual login page, and uh, that was the VPN help page of University of Delaware. So that was a pretty neat fish. And the good thing about uh, that fish was, even though if people were falling for that fish on off campus, we were able to determine that because it, they were getting redirected to our website. So if we, we would have just looked for that redirection in the HTTP log, we could have easily found out that who all fall for that, who all fell for that fish. Uh, and we were just thinking that uh, one of the motivations for attackers to actually do that kind of redirection is they do not want people to realize after falling for fish that they actually fall for fish because the phishing page they have, it looks pretty neat. But after you put in your credentials, they either say, okay, something failed or, and something failed or something bad happened. And then people actually realize that that is not the actual a page that looks after we log into our real website and they quickly reset their password. So it's not very useful for fishers that if the people are easily um, able to find out after falling for a fish that we actually fell for a fish. So that's how they came up with like kind, kind of like a new, new technique where they were actually redirecting the, users to the, re redirecting the users to the actual legit 
UDL pages so that they can uh, they can think that oh we might have submitted bad credentials and that's why we are having this uh, CAS login page again and which happens pretty frequently with me as well like if I'm in a hurry I, I type my credentials and most of the time the first time I type my credentials is always wrong so I get the CAS login page back so um, that was a good idea by Fishers um, to do that so um, these are the uh, I cannot see. So these are the log entries from the http.log file that Bro generates. And these are the people who fall for the fish from off campus. As you can see, the source IP, that's different. And uh, the, the redirection was happening to our own website, which was udel.edu. And that was happening on a VPN help page. So the actual URL that people clicked was SSL. It's in the red. Uh, it says SSL VPN udel slash edu dot cs information supports dot ga, which is not our domain. So people were actually clicking on that site. And since it was HTTP, we were able to see the username and password that, that they actually typed in. And I think, uh, yeah, I have redacted the password and username. Yeah, I was just making sure. <laughs> so <laughs> so uh, that was the actual URL. And we just grabbed our HTTP log to see who all fall for it. And then we were having like a lot of accounts that were off campus because if you are not monitoring the, uh, like if they are on campus and people fall for it on campus, it's easy to detect. But if they are off campus, there is no way you can find it out because that's the network or that's the traffic you are not monitoring. So that was a good thing that Fishers did that we can easily find out that we can just see the redirection to our uh, help VPN help page, and we were easily we were able to find them out. So just simple command command line kung fu. You can uh, you are, you can just grab through that uh, you are referrer URL and you can just actually see the username and username and password of people who fall for that fish offline and whatever we usually do is that whenever we get a phishing page before taking it down we actually submit the dummy credentials uh, that actually looks some, something intelligent in this it's super dumb it's sdf gh it's a sequence on the keyboard but we actually try to uh, try to put some uh, get, to uh, send some valid credentials so, not valid sorry uh, some intelligent credentials so that if they are ever used on our um, login cas login page or any login website then we can easily track down the ip that was using those dummy credentials and we can further track down that what were the successful user accounts that IP had tried on our login page and that's how we disable our accounts and go from there so that was a pretty uh, easy find it was pretty easy and yeah and people were thinking that oh we have done super uh, crazy stuff to find out that all the accounts were compromised but it was not very super crazy it was just a grab through the http.log file of pro that generated that uh, redirection so that was the easy find for us on VPN Fish. So that's it. You don't have my six. Oh, he's got it. Okay. Yep, so I have uh, six minutes here. And, uh, of course, didn't have the time to change my slides to reflect the new name. But with my six minutes, I want to make sure I just take time to talk about how great Docker is as far as it can, you know, what it can do for you. The Kubernetes is this orchestration framework that is just wonderful. Containers and System D is a much better system for doing RC scripts and just how wonderful Linux is. Well, I'm actually going to talk about just a little introduction about myself. Um, and last time more about advocacy, this time just things I've been trying to do to make Bro run better on FreeBSD and OpenBSD, some bug fixes, ports and packages that I've been trying to get in, and then some advocacy things and uh, next steps for me. Um, short intro, I've been doing this since 2003. Actually, saw a friend I used to work with, uh, with Dragon, um, uh, Marcus, uh, when his keynotes, like I, I have touched NFR in the past, and I also think part of the slide got cut off, but essentially work with a uh, rule management that I actually have talked with half of the time here in, in addition to BSD uh, topics. Um, that didn't look too good, but essentially Bro Interface Setup is a plugin um, package that you can install um, that uh, Justin wrote, and it's also hosted for NCSA. 
And I submitted this stuff because this is the way that on an interface for FreeBSD, you should be able to just disable all the checksumming so that you can ensure you're not having any issues with the, the network interface card. Um, but when I tried to test those commands, I was seeing that when I tried to disable the receive uh, side uh, checksumming, I had actually, based on the options, enable IPv6 checksumming and vice versa. So there was this, I submitted it as a bug for the if configs not taking my commands and, and changing everything as it should. Um, that turned into an issue of what FreeBSD has been doing with their modular inputs for uh, network drivers. And uh, so instead of it being an if config bug, it's a bug in how um, the uh, if lib was bringing in that EM driver for this particular interface, and uh, that's the bug. And at least it's fixed in uh, 12 current. I assume it will be making out with uh, when they release FreeBSD 12 in the next coming coming months. Um, fun bro thing that I had to get clarification on about for as far as for the workflow when things are fixed, such as ISSH with all my BSD systems, other BSD systems, and you'd get the, the wonderful bro log that this is a weird um, algorithm, but this should be, I believe, in 2.6. It looks like it, the um, issue went away from me. And of course, for everyone, test the beta so you can find any other issues that um, might be present. Um, yeah, this slide, I tried to put it in. It's difficult to show it all, but essentially for the, the, the standard bro port, um, if you do package install in a FreeBSD box, you want to run bro. There was no kind of uh, RC script that was in place for running, uh, just, just to make things a little bit easier. There's probably some other work that could be done. I just made it very basic so that you can run the FreeBSD sysrc to enable bro and then service bro deploy, just like you would do bro control. I just wrapped a, an RC script, some, some stuff around that. Um, but it'd be nice if just for, also for the bro package, um, um, package manager to be able to install bro and the package manager. So I looked to set out to make a bro port um, for the, the package manager. Essentially, there's a lot of other packages in FreeBSD where you can, uh, it's just Python scripts, but just to ensure that you can trust the source so when it's built by the FreeBSD package system, you just package install whatever the Python script is. Um, so I had a port I was creating and I use other um, Python scripts as examples for how to bring those in. Um, and you can come talk to me a lot of time for that about how a lot of that stuff um, works on the FreeBSD side. Um, but I, unfortunately, you also need B-test, as was uh, Robin uh, point show, showed a little bit yesterday, where you build it when you build it, you have to also be able to test it. So I actually had to make two ports in order to, to, to get this to work, because um, normally you just have you know, the, the pip install and some other things if you're doing it from the command line. Um, so there's two bugs there, it got cut off on the slide, um, that basically I'm waiting to get these, both these ports uh, in, into the ports tree so you then be able to install it and run your packages. But uh, the uh, one issue, and the slide's got a little cut off, um, with the current one is just also was like it was covered. You, when you have a port, you don't necessarily have the source code for how that port was built in FreeBSD. So, you kind of need to either, if you're, if you're custom building bro, which I think a lot of people actually do, uh, if you're doing testing, it's a simple change in, in the bro package config to just change where your source code is because it needs the header files. Um, and I was told that when I was talking about this, that this is something in 2.6 bro where the, the, the necessary files will be put down so it won't be an issue. But if you're on the FreeBSD box and you run it, then you're going to have to deal with that. Um, so the, the kind of fixes to leave your build environment when you build the port in kind of a not so great state by not cleaning it, and you do a little hack to change it, and that actually is a way around it, but that's not ideal. 40 seconds. Um, and just kind of like as I've been talking to people, it's, it's fun for, uh, you know, BSD seems to fit everyone's use case is just kind of, you know, I got my home PF Sense box or something like that that I'm using for, for low bandwidth monitoring. And it seems like for the most part in, you know, I, I talk to some people when they've come overseas or I'm talking to uh, BSD CAN um, where they do, they do have a use case for doing network monitoring, but it's, it's just such a, it's not much of as far as for advocacy for someone using PF Sense. Um, but, it, you know, I, I, still, I still try to push it as a solution. I use it for everything that I do, BSD, and we're not going to talk about Beehive and ZFS at this point because I have t five seconds. Um, and it's fun for, for Bro itself because there's, there seems to be users, there seems to be some people that actually come in and talk about, um, you know, wanting to use stuff, and there's these phantom open BSD users that I hear about. Uh, the uh, port, um, I'm wrapping up, um, the port, uh, person that made the port says that there is a large user base that have been installing the port, but I haven't really had any communication with them. So it's just one of those things, like if anyone is actually using OpenBSD, I'd love to hear about it, because I don't know where these users are. I just don't know. Yep, 
Um, last thing, make Seth happy, make LB a natural command. You can just run in, uh, the, as a package or a port. I have to do all the stuff and um, still working on the BSD NSM. Sorry, right on time. Yeah, so hello everyone. I'm Jan. I'm from KIT Karlsruhe in Germany and I'm a PhD candidate and um, I will talk to you about a package I recently developed and released. Um, should be not bro, but it's uh, at least fuzzy hashing. Um, yeah, what is fuzzy hashing? So um, if you have a look at the two images there, um, you might notice that um, the image uh, framed red uh, is slightly different from the image framed green. Um, there's a small red dot, uh, one of the black dots is a small red dot in the red framed image. Um, and if you're going to hash these uh, images with a, a traditional hash like uh, SHA-1, um, you will see that they turn out to have completely different hashes. Um, that is, of course, a um, very desired property for um, cryptographic hashing, so you don't want to have collisions, and uh, thus you um, have that effect that's called uh, avalanche effect. Um, but for fuzzy hashing, um, you won't see that effect. So there are um, algorithms um, called fuzzy hashing algorithms or uh, locality-sensitive hashing algorithms. Um, and they turn out um, to produce hashes like you see here, um, where that small change uh, in the image uh, results only in the small change of the hash. Um, so what I did um, now to get that into Bro um, is to write a plugin, um, uh, a Bro plugin, a file analyzer plugin like Robin presented yesterday. Um, and that plugin just um, interfaces known libraries um, that, uh, for example, use the TLSH uh, hash or the SSD hash, um, which is available in the libfuzzy. And um, that plugin just spots the same functionality as um, the traditional bro hashing um, machine read does. So there is a file analyzer and there's also an OPEC type that can be used to manually feed in data. Um, this is all available as the bro package. So um, how is it used? Um, if you just want to hash a file, you have um, to attach the analyzer. Um, you do it in events like file sniff and just attach the SHA-1 uh, analyzer here. And then once the file is read, um, you can will um, see an event uh, called file hash. Um, and the hash is made available um, to you. Um, so for the fuzzy hashing, it's basically the same. After you've installed the plugin, um, you can just attach, uh, for example, a TLSH um, analyzer, and you get the new event that's called um, file fuzzy hash, um, and you can just obtain the fuzzy hash here. So now, what are the use cases? Um, of course, uh, there's approximate file matching that maybe um, would be a use case, but um, there could only also be uh, another use case, um, which is incomplete files. So for now, if you have some capture loss um, in Bro, um, and you have a larger connection transferring files, you will likely not obtain any um, of the hashes because once there's a single packet uh, missing, um, Bro cannot calculate the hash. So um, in the case of fuzzy hashing, you can still calculate the hash and um, the probability that that hash is still similar to um, what would be the actual hash for the file um, is uh, uh, quite high. So there are still open questions because I haven't tested that in production. Um, it's not clear whether it can be used for approx uh, approximate file matching um, in a useful sense. So um, at first I had that example of an um, image. If you think of images that are compressed, of course, um, something, some changes in the images um, that look very small might turn out to um, yeah, just change the um, whole encoded image. 
So in that case, uh, also fuzzy hashing won't work. Um, but especially an open question is performance. So um, we assume that uh, fuzzy hashing performance is not comparable to the classical hashes. But if you're interested uh, and want to have a look at it, um, just uh, yeah, install the package, uh, have a look at um, the GitHub uh, repository, or just drop me a mail. Thank you. Thank you.